Good morning, everybody. Happy Sabbath. Welcome to another sunny day in Fife. Today is especially sunny. It's sunnier inside than it is outside, isn't it? It's wonderful to have the church full and to have the lid off the baptistry. It's always a good day. <laughs> it's always a good day when we get to take the lid off the baptistry. Um, and it's, it's a real shame. So when um, my Arbor and I, a few weeks ago, um, we took the lid off the baptistry just to, to have a look, and we realized it's been a while since it was last used. It needed, should we say, a little bit of a clean? <laughs> it needed a lot of a clean, um, which, is, which is sad. That tells us we don't, we don't do this often enough. Um, but it's wonderful that we have four people who are giving their lives to, to Jesus today in this, in this public manner. Um, as we as we celebrate together with them, um, so we'll we have our service today. We have the baptism. Um, it's also wonderful to welcome Pastor Jimmy and Professor Noodlebrain, or Sadrine, as you also know her, um, back. Um, so uh, for those of you who don't know, Pastor Jimmy was the pastor here before Gabriel was. Um, so most of us know Jimmy very well. Um, Jimmy has. Uh, taken up the, uh, the, the the challenge of being the president of the Scottish Mission um, after Pastor Paul Tompkins retired uh, last year. So you're kind of six months, a little bit over six months into this now, um, uh, which is uh, which is great. So he's uh, living up in Perth, working in Creef as the with the office. But it's great that he could be here to support us today on the, um, on this day. Um, and yeah, today's going to be. It's going to be amazing. A day with a baptism can never be a bad day. It's, it's always a great day. So we have the four baptisms here um, for the Dunfermline Church. This afternoon at 4.30, there are also four baptisms happening um, for the Edinburgh Church. So, you know, we spend a lot of time together as a district. We know the guys from the Edinburgh Church very well. So this afternoon we have um, four baptisms from the Edinburgh Church as well. Um, they are not being baptized in the baptistry in the Edinburgh Church. They're being baptized in the Torduff Reservoir. Is that the name of the reservoir? Um, we have a, we have a map. There's a place. There's a we have a map. There's a place to park. It take about 15 minutes to get from there to the place where the actual baptism will be. It'll be an open water baptism, so nice and cold um, for for those who are in the water. Um, but yes, so there are four young people from the Edinburgh Church who are getting baptized, and there are more being baptized over the over the coming weeks as well um so it would be great if everyone could get over f uh, this afternoon for for the baptisms in edinburgh as well um, we'll definitely be going um over for that gabriel he'll be there as well i imagine um jimmy are you you meant you're, you're getting over as well so that there'll be a, there'll be several um people coming uh, going from edinburgh be, uh, from dunfermline so it'd be great if you could um, go over as well this at the moment um we're now ready. Um, Gabriel has the next thing he wants us to do. Um, I don't know where Gabriel's disappeared to. So we could perhaps possibly just do the first song instead, and then he can do his bit after. Afraid of water, possibly. Um, it's possibly. I also note the four baptismal candidates are not here in the room with us, so I imagine he's probably with them. Uh, here we go. Are you ready for the vows? Ready. ready. Right. We'll hand over to Pastor Gabriel. Uh, Jeff, do you want to call them in? Yeah. Yeah. Not yet. Oh, it's okay. I'll, I'll wait. It's okay. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. It is so lovely to be able to have a Sabbath uh, to celebrate a, a new birth. Uh, as you can see, the water is there. It's, it's been warming up. In fact, we still have the heater here, so it's, it's been warmed up semi-jacuzzi-like. Uh, so if you want to experience a jacuzzi, we can fill it up and get baptized too. So that's, it's a cheater's way to do it. But yeah, so this morning, we are, well, actually this whole day is a beautiful Sabbath of celebration where we practice, uh, as you see in Scripture, the biblical teaching of baptism. Uh, the word baptism or baptizo means to immerse or to submerge the person in the water, kind of like when you get a biscuit and you dunk it in your tea and it comes out. That's the same idea, exactly right. Now, baptism, as I've shared with the individuals who are coming forward here, uh, it represents three things. When we look at Scripture, baptism is an imitation of what Jesus himself has done. Yeah, that's fine. 
It's representative of what Jesus Christ has done by Jesus dying on the cross, being buried in the tomb, and then resurrecting from the grave. When Jesus invites us, when you read the book of Mark and the book of Matthew, you find that Jesus invites us, if we want to follow Jesus, that we must take up our cross and follow him. The idea is dying to our past. Now, I have no access to anyone's memory bank here, but if we were to just go back in our memory bank, we can see that perhaps we've said some things wrong or done some things wrong, or uh, perhaps there are things in our history that are a little bit shady. Baptism is an opportunity to say, Jesus, I've made some mistakes. And when we go into the water, what the Lord does, like when we take our wash into, into, in, into the laundry, the Lord washes us over. And when we come out of the waters, like Jesus coming out of the grave, we come out as a new creation, as new creatures. And interestingly enough, if you've ever want to take a time, you can, you can do a YouTube search of a lot of baptismal sites across the different places, not just in Jerusalem and in Israel, but all across the Roman Empire. You will find that there were specific areas where people would have to be baptized in secret because it was outlawed for people to get baptized, but many hundreds of thousands and hundreds of thousands of people would be baptized because they wanted to have Jesus become the Lord of their lives. I'll ask the baptismal candidates to come forward. I know we're waiting for one more, but we'll ask the ladies. Come on over, ladies. They're coming forward. We're doing something that is called baptismal vows, and we'll put them on the screen. Is that right? Baptismal vows. The reason why these are called baptismal vows, as a, as a Christian, stand right here in front, right next to me here, yeah. As uh, Christians, we read in Scripture that the church is called the bride of Christ. He is our bridegroom. So when we become baptized, we're making a commitment to have Jesus become our, our metaphorical, our spiritual husband. So we do something that's called baptismal vows. We'll put them on the screen here in a second. And we're going to go through the different things that we find in Scripture uh, as a commitment to these different things. As a commitment to Jesus, this is my, my vows to you. And we're waiting for one more gentleman who is uh, Isvan, who's going to be changing. And he's coming over here in just a second. But over there to our right, we have Jessica. Jessica, say hi. This is Jessica. And Janet. We have Chanel. And then Isan will be coming here in a second. Just a quick story as you kind of, uh, as, as we wait for Isan to come. Uh, Janet came here to the church before I had met her. And she met Charles and Jessica as well. And Isan, they all met Charles first. Uh, and one of the things that they shared the very first Sabbath that we met them is they said they wanted to get baptized. That was just about a year ago. Uh, they, our church had opened up from being in lockdown in the month of April. We opened up our churches. And here come these lovely ladies and say, we want to we wanna get baptized. And over the past few months, we've been studying scripture together. We've been going to Judith and Keith's house over there in Kakati, studying scripture with them. Chanel uh, is a person who has been tremendously passionate about serving the church. As you guys have been here, if you know her, you know she has a tremendous gift for singing, for music, and to serve the Lord in this way. She's the daughter of one of our elders, and I don't know where Genevieve, oh, there she is right here. The daughter of one of our elders. And it's so, it's so beautiful to see our young people. Yesterday I thought she was 13 years old, but I was corrected. She's 15 years old. But it's so amazing to see young people say, I want to give my life to Jesus. Amen? Amen. Amen. And then Isvan, as he comes, I'm going to tell a little bit of a story here in just a second, uh, as he's coming over here. Uh, he, his father passed away about a year, a little bit over a year ago. And that led him to search for some answers, wanting to know a little bit more of, of what's happening in this world and the loss of his dad that led him to search the scriptures. And he started doing some YouTube searches. And he found some amazing messages about Jesus and his call to his life. And Ephron showed up to our church two weeks after we opened up our church. Oh, the, it was the, sorry, not the dad, thank you. It was the mom that passed away, forgive me, it wasn't the dad, it was the mom that passed away. Two weeks after we opened up our church, Ephron shows up to church. And the first few words that he tells to Charles is he wants to get baptized. I'll tell you something right now. Uh, baptism is not a, a practice, a religious practice. Baptism is a spiritual practice. It's not something that we do as Seventh-day Adventists alone. It is something that we find in Scripture where Jesus himself was baptized by his cousin John, as well as many hundreds of thousands of people and millions of people throughout history have done what these four individuals 
are going to do here in just a second. Jessica, Isvan, the, the, the robe was too, is Isvan coming? The robe was a little tight for him. He's got broad shoulders and a big chest. Yeah, wait for him to come here in a second. Just want to make sure that we give him some time. Come on in. We have seats over here. We have seats up at the front. We have some seats. So, yeah, we're going to have to snuggle up close. Yeah. Come on over, Isvan. There he comes. I just told a little bit about your story, Isvan. It's a little, you have too much muscle. Yeah. So if you, uh, ladies and gentlemen, would turn to the screen. Everybody can follow along. We'll put it up there on the screen. The first, what I'll do is I'll read through all 13 of these. And then at the end, I'll just pass you the microphone and you can say, yes, I do. And that'll proceed towards baptism. So the first one is, do you believe in God the Father, in His Son, Jesus Christ, and in the Holy Spirit? Number two, do you accept the death of Jesus Christ on Calvary as the atoning sacrifice for the sins of men and believe that through faith in his shed blood, men are saved from sin and its penalty? Number three, do you renounce the world and its sinful ways? Have you accepted Jesus Christ as your personal savior? Do you believe that God, for Christ's sake, has forgiven your sins and given you a new heart? Number four, do you accept by faith the righteousness of Christ, recognizing him as your intercessor in the heavenly sanctuary? And do you claim his promise to strengthen you by the Holy Spirit so that you may receive power to do his will? Number five, do you believe that the Bible is God's inspired word and that it constitutes the only rule of faith and practice for the Christian? Number six, do you accept the Ten Commandments as still binding upon Christians? And is it your purpose to keep this law, including the Fourth Commandment, which requires the observance of the seventh day of the week as the Sabbath of the Lord? Number seven, is the soon coming of Jesus the blessed hope in your heart? And are you determined to be personally ready to meet the Lord and do all in your power to witness to his loving salvation? And by life and word to help others to be ready for his glorious appearing. Number nine, or number eight, excuse me. Do you accept the Bible teaching of spiritual gifts? And do you believe that the gift of prophecy in his remnant church is one of the identifying marks of that church? Number nine, do you believe in God's remnant people? And is it your purpose to support the church by tithes and offerings, personal effort and influence? Number 10. Do you believe that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit and that you're to honor God by caring for your body, avoiding the use of which is harmful, abstaining from all unclean foods, from the use and manufacture and sale of alcoholic beverages, the use, manufacture and sale of tobacco in any of its forms for human consumption, and from the misuse or trafficking in narcotics or other drugs? Now, for those of you guys that are here, you may be wondering why all of this. These vows are things that we do all across the globe. And we believe that as Christians, that our body is a temple of the Holy Spirit. So what we want to put into our body are godly things, but also what comes out of our life are also godly things as well. Number 11. Knowing and understanding the fundamental Bible principles as taught by the Seventh-day Adventist Church, is it your purpose by the grace of God to order your life in harmony with these fundamental beliefs? Number 12, do you accept the New Testament teaching of baptism by immersion? And do you desire to be so baptized as a public expression of your faith in Christ and in the forgiveness of your sins? And lastly, do you believe that the Seventh-day Adventist Church fulfills the prophetic remnant role of Bible prophecy as read in Revelation 12, 17? And that people of every nation, race, and language are invited and accepted into its fellowship? Do you desire to be a member of this local congregation here in Scotland and of the world church? So let me pass this microphone. Here, the vows as we've been studying together, so we'll turn around and face our crowd here together. 
Do you, do you accept what we have shared here in our vow? Yes, I do. Amen. 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 Sing it loud. Uh, yeah, I do. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Janet. Yes, I do. Amen. Amen. Jessica. Yes, I do. Amen. 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 My Abba, if you and Jean will walk our ladies and gentlemen over and they'll get... Oh, they're already changed. You guys have to wait for me to change now. Charles, what do we have next in the service there? So I, I can uh, go still be uh, the hymn. All right. Hymn. So if you guys will have a seat somewhere here, let me go change. I'll come right back. I'll ask the praise team to come forward and sing together. Come have a seat, guys, while I change. Thank right. you very much, Pastor. So our opening hymn is going to be hymn number 296, Lord, I'm Coming Home. I've wandered far away from God.
Test, test, test. I am uh, I'm very humbled for the opportunity to be in these waters. Uh, seeing as, as ministers, we are very blessed to have an opportunity to bring individuals who have gotten to know their Savior Jesus and to say, ultimately, I want to give my life to Him. Uh, like I said, many individuals throughout history have made this same decision. And I'm very, uh, I'm very grateful to know that when we read in the book of Revelation that there is a great multitude that follow the Lamb wherever He goes, here are four individuals who are part of that great multitude. Amen? Amen. Amen. So I'll begin with calling Isvan. Come on over here. Doctor, if you'll help me help bring them into the water, please. The water's tepid. It's not hot. It's not cold. But it's definitely better than open water. So Isvan, we've, uh, we've met here at the church Thursday evenings for some time now, and our, our Bible study is a mixture of, of Bible study and conversation. We sometimes will just sit and talk, and it's been such, such an experience, Isvan, to get to know you as a man, to get to know you as a, as a father, and, and especially now it, over the course of this time together to see you grow as a Christian. We have a song that we have for Isvan here. Uh, a song that he's shared with me before, and the song, the hymn is I Surrender All. So we'll sing the song together, and then we'll proceed with baptizing Isvan. Let's sing together.
Father who art in heaven, may your name truly be sanctified and hallowed in this place this morning. Father, we thank you for the decision that your son, Eastlan, has made to give his life, not just now, but for the rest of eternity, to his and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Father, we pray that as he enters these waters, that who he was, his plans, his dreams, his agenda, his history may truly be washed away. Not just by the waters, but by the blood of the Lamb. And we pray, Lord, that as he goes into the waters and as he comes up, we ask that his name may be written in the book of life. So now, as a minister of the gospel, I baptize you for the forgiveness of your sins. In the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, Jesus Christ, and in the name of the Holy Spirit. Amen. 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 I'll call Chanel to come up. Chanel. So Chanel, I believe, has been looking forward and excited for this moment for quite some time. I had an opportunity to go to her house after the first lockdown when the decision was made. She shared with Genevieve mom, and we had an opportunity to make plans for this day. And it's so wonderful to see young women like her who are making this decision. We find, as we have our three ladies here this morning, that when Jesus resurrected from the tomb the first persons that were charged to go and deliver the, the amazing blessing from God that the Son, Jesus, had resurrected from the grave were ladies. So we are so grateful to have these persons, to be able to give them over to our Savior, Jesus. Now we have a special song for Chanel, and the song is called... Hymn of Heaven. Heaven. Hymn, Hymn of, of Heaven. Heaven. Hymn of Heaven. She can sing as well. <laughs> you can if you want.
Father, we thank you so much because as you look down from heaven, you see this wonderful event. We see that there is a young woman who has decided to say to Jesus, your son, I want you to be the Lord of my life. And Father, we thank you because we have so many young boys and young girls this morning here in the front row who can be a witness to a young life who says, not only do I want to live for Jesus today, I want to live for Jesus the rest of my life. Mm -hmm. So Father, I pray that as Chanel continues to grow from here, that she may continue to be a testimony, a witness of what it means to be a young person who is in love for Jesus, who cares for the well-being of her fellow men. So, Father, this morning, I ask that you may bless Chanel with a cleansing life and a future filled with your Holy Spirit. So now as a minister of the gospel, I baptize her for the forgiveness of sins. In the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, Jesus Christ, and in the name of the Holy Spirit, amen. 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 Come on up here, Chanel. Yeah. I'll call Jessica to come forward. It's been quite wonderful, there are three children, uh, to see them come and worship here in this house, to grow and, and, and become closer to their Savior Jesus. I heard a funny story from Janet and Jessica when I was in their home this past week. Uh, they were so zealous and anxious to give their life to Christ that they were even going to go into a river and baptize each other. <laughs> that is true commitment. Now, there's no Gretna Green for baptism, so it's not like running off and getting married. But I know that you two have, have had this desire in your heart for quite some time. And Jessica, I'm so happy to see that you as a young, passionate mother can say, I want to serve Jesus and live for Jesus the rest of my life. To raise your three lovely children in the ways of the Lord. Now, Jessica, you have a special song that's called... The Spirit Lives to Set Us Free, Walk in the Light. So let's sing this song together.
it's so wonderful when I see Jessica because she walks into church and sees us. She smiles. Smiles are contagious. Especially when you know why you are smiling. Jessica, we have a beautiful reason to smile for the rest of our life, and that is the fact that because Jesus has conquered death, we know that we have life that is eternally promised to each one of us. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much because just as we've seen each and Chanel give their life to you, we have now Jessica who has made the same decision. Father, we praise you and we thank you for a life that can be transformed and changed, not just into a better human being, but into a better and likelier image of our Savior, Jesus. Amen. So, Father, we pray that the same spirit that brought Jesus up and inspired him and led him in his life may also be one that inspires and leads Jessica as well. Amen. We pray that her testimony, that as we have sang this song, that her light may shine brightly wherever she goes. So now as a minister of the gospel, I baptize her for the forgiveness of her sins. In the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, Jesus Christ, and in the name of the Holy Spirit, amen. Amen. wonderful whenever we get together at the 11 home and study scripture together when Janet is there she contributes so much already of her knowledge of God's Word and what the Holy Spirit has already spoken to her in the past in her life but also to see how much she has a desire to continue to grow and learn so much more in fact whenever we have some questions and answers Janet is ready with some questions and that's somebody that you feel you sense the Holy Spirit working in their lives because they know more about not just God's word they want to know more about Jesus Janet it's a beautiful thing whenever we enter into these waters and come up because we have the promise and the assurance of eternal life to each one of us now you've chosen a song as well Charles the song is spirit of God in the clear running water spirit of God in the clear running water let's sing that I'm learning new songs today Spirit of God in the clear running water, going to greatness that lives on the view. Spirit of God in the mingle of burning, fill the earth, bring it to birth and blow where you will. I believe that what the Lord has been doing in Janet's life is only the start. There's so much 
more, Janet, that the Lord is going to continue to do through your life. I know you have been yearning for quite some time for this. The individuals behind me as well. And I'm very blessed with this opportunity to give you over to our Lord Jesus. Let's pray together. Thank you so much for a life who has made, who has made a decision to say, I want to live the rest of my life and the rest of my eternity in company with my Savior Jesus. And that Lord, I know, Lord, that this desire is not just in Janet's heart. It's of all of us that are here present. We desire to live for the rest of eternity with you. And Father, we pray that just as Janet has been serving you and committed her life to the past, that that commitment, that desire may only be amplified for the future. So now, as a minister of the gospel, I baptize you, Janet, for the forgiveness of your sins. In the name of the Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, and in the name of the Holy Spirit. Amen. It's such an amazing opportunity to be in these waters and to bring these newly baptized children over to our Lord Jesus. At the end of the sermon today, uh, when Pastor Jimmy finishes speaking, we're going to call these four well, now members of our church, of the Fellowship of Christians, to come forward. We'll call the elders who are here present and we'll have a special prayer for them. Now, for a lot of us here, we haven't made that decision quite yet to say I want to give my life for I don't want to live in this world, for this world anymore. I, I want to have that certain blessed future for myself as well. If you have a desire to, to know more about Jesus, to learn more about the Bible, to say, what is it that led these individuals to give their life to Jesus? If you have a desire to learn more about that and to enter into these baptismal waters, please feel free to speak to myself, to any one of our members here in our church, to Charles or Genevieve, our elders in the church. And we'd love to teach you a little bit more about who Jesus is what the Bible teaches. And if you already have a desire, say, I, I want to get baptized as soon as possible. Please let us know, and we would love to bring you to the feet of Jesus. We're going to have a prayer, and take a quick picture, and then we'll all go change, and we'll go on to the rest of our service. Father in heaven, we want to pray in thanksgiving, in adoration to you, because you take our lives whether broken, whether sinful, whether whatever it may be, you take us as we are, but you give us a new robe, a new clothing of righteousness, which is the righteousness of our Savior Jesus. So, Father, this morning we want to ask the same spirit that has led these four individuals to surrender their life to Jesus and to live a life for Jesus, that your same Holy Spirit amongst your people here present, that if there is one who has not made a decision or one who wants to know more, that your spirit may continue to work in their hearts. For those of us that have made the decision and have been baptized already, may your same Holy Spirit to draw us closer to yourself. We pray that the four individuals behind us and those of us that are here present may continue to live a life in witness, shining for Jesus for all, all the time that we have here before our Savior Jesus comes back. So Father, I put these four persons and our church into your hands. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.
Amen, everybody. Amen. 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 So they're off to, to get themselves dry, um, sort themselves out. Um, while that's happening, um, we're going to ask Professor Noodlebrain to come forward. And all our kids are mostly at the front anyway. If there's any more kids who want to come towards the front, anybody upstairs wants to come down for the children's story, then Professor Noodlebrain has a story for you. Oh, more than a story, I think. Make sure I don't break anything. <laughs> Good morning, everybody. Lovely. All right. So this is going to show my age and maybe a lot of people's age here this morning. And to anybody joining us online, good morning. So how many of you have ever played the game Follow My Leader? Right? Good, 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 good. Yes, some adult hands coming up there. Good. Uh, if you haven't played Follow My Leader, how many of you have played the game Simon Says? All right, there we go. A lot more. All right. All right, who would like to come up here and share with those who don't know what? is it about the game of follow my leader? What are the rules of that game? Anybody want to come share? Siren? No? Okay. Come on over, Owen. All right. So, Owen, you're going to explain what are the rules of follow my leader? I know the Simon Says ones. Okay. Simon Says. Go for it. So, pretty much you have to follow what the other person does or, like, says, but... Only if they say, like, Simon says, jump. But if they just say jump, you're out if you do it, the action. All right. So let's give it a try. You're going to be Simon Says. All right. So everybody here in the front, stand up. All right. And if you're an adult and you want to just move your body a little bit, stand up as well. All right. So I'm going to hand over to Owen. Let's just do three, three goes. All right. So remember, if he says, Simon says, you do it. If he just says something, don't do it. Let's have a go. Uh, Simon says, say Simon says. Simon says. Uh, Simon says, say Eugene. Eugene. <laughs> Simon says, uh, sit down. Stand up. Simon says, uh, clap your hands twice. Brilliant. All right. Well done. Well done. Thank you very much, Owen. So follow my leader is obviously you're having to obey the rules. Otherwise, you're out. How does it make you feel when you're out? Sad, doesn't it? You're like, oh, man. Well, being a friend of Jesus, he asks us to follow him. And sometimes we think that following him is quite difficult. But in actual fact, it is easy. And I'm going to explain why. Uh, I don't, funny enough, I didn't expect to have a lot of young people today, so I'm not going to have enough for everybody to take part, but you can try it at home. Are you sure? You're going to have to get more, get more water as well. All right, so we've got some glasses here, some cups, and I'm going to put some water in them. And then, who's thirsty? 
All right, Agatha, you're definitely getting one. All right, so we've got some couple down here. Now, when you're thirsty, what do you like to drink your juice with? Do you drink it just from the cup, or do you perhaps use a straw? You just drink from the cup? Who drinks from a straw? Yeah, Maddie, you like drinking from a straw. I know, I like drinking from a straw. Just go as many. All right, so if you can come up and take a glass of water. Genevieve, could we get some more water, please? Oh, there we go. Perfect. All right. All right, so come up and get us a glass of water. Thank you. And a straw. Oop, there you go. Okay, straw. Raise All right. There's a straw. Don't drink it yet. Don't drink it yet. <laughs> Did you get a straw? There we go. All right. Denise, do you want a straw? She doesn't have water yet. She hasn't got water there. Here we go, Mommy. All right. There we go. Okay. Lovely. We need to top up. <laughs> All right. All right, so just everybody's got their straw, everybody's got their water. Lovely. I want you to take one sip with your straw, okay? Not too bad. It's nice and cool. How easy was it to suck? Easy peasy, yes? Easy peasy, lemon squeezy. All right. Now, let's hope we've got enough straws. Uncle Jimmy, can you hand out another straw to each one? But now, before you take another sip, we're not going to put it inside. Hold it outside of your glass. All right. Okay. Got it. <laughs> I thought that was going to be mine. All right, lovely. Okay, they're just using the stores. Cool. May I use one, please? Thank you. All right, now I want you to hold your second straw so that the top lip matches your other straw, but it needs to be outside of your glass. All right, so if you hold the two lips of your straws together, like that. and then I want you to take a, another sip. All right, what's happening? Who's getting water? All right, are you getting the same amount of water as you did with just the one straw? No. You can't get anything. All right. Okay. What's happening this side? Can you get water when you've got the two straws? But just a little bit? Yeah. All right. Now, five second rule. I want you to take the straw that's outside of your cup and put it in so you've got the two straws together. And now take a sip. Now you get double. That was fun, wasn't it? So just like we have, um, Jesus has asked us to follow him, this is the one straw. And when we have just the one straw and we have a nice sip, ah, it's really, 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 really nice. But then sometimes... 
we take ourselves and we go outside of what God asks us to do. And we do our own thing. We try our best to make things work. We make our own plans. And then when we try to work with God, what happens? We end up sucking air. It doesn't work quite as well. And so when we put ourselves again back into the water with Jesus, we get a double helping of water. And it tastes so much better. So I want you to take another big, big sip. Oh, we've got even, he's extended his over here. Mmm. You're going to try with both together? Mm Mm-hmm. All right. So hopefully you'll remember when Jesus asks us to follow him, He's asking us to work with him, not outside of him. And today we saw how these four people decided to follow Jesus. And so they have asked Jesus to work with them to be inside the glass together, drinking from two straws instead of being separate outside. And so we're going to ask you to look into your heart and to think one day Jesus is asking you the same today. Would you like to be with Jesus or are we going to be outside of Jesus? You want to be with Jesus. Amen. All right. So have some fun with your glasses and with your straws, but let's have a prayer together. Dear Jesus, we thank you that you are our example. You have come into this world that you were baptized. You came and said to your disciples and to us to follow you. And sometimes that road does get difficult, but you were always there with us. And you have said in your word, you will never leave us nor forsake us. So help us to take our straws, dear Lord, make them be together with you and not away and apart from you. That we may drink of your water and drink of your love. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All right. Thank you. Thank you very much. You want another one? You want three? Hand over to Pastor Jimmy. By the way, where, where, where are, where's everybody who's been baptized? Are they still changing? Sorry, was I meant to? Oh no, no, no! What happens is I was just looking. I, no, no, I, I was looking to see on my social media. No, I was actually um, looking to see how many followers I have on social media. Um, sorry about that. How many followers do you have? On social media. Have have you got any? I have some. Let me check. Where is 
my phone. Oh, I, I mean, you can just have a look and then you look on social media and it says how many followers you have. That's, you know, and I know some people have more than others. Um, I don't particularly have many, unfortunately, or fortunately. Um, hmm? Oh, I don't know. Oh, I don't even know where to look for it, but apparently it's there. And so, um, so, so followers. By the way, did any of you notice when you came in the door of the church, there's something painted on the side of the wall in the inside of the church once you came through the door? Anyone know what it says? Hope House. I heard it somewhere. Follow me, Follow me yes. Ah. <laughs> but, but those of you who've been in this building for a very long time will know that. I wonder if anyone else actually picked up and saw that there was something written on the wall inside there by the church door. It says, follow me. Follow me. And, and, and the word follow is, is an important word today, I think, um, because as you can imagine, um, um, you know, if uh, I've heard Pastor Gabriel even say it once or twice. That when these individuals came to a place where they wanted to be baptized, they wanted to do something specific. Um, and that was to follow Christ. That was to follow Jesus. And so how many followers does Jesus have? <laughs> I'm asking first with no uh, big number. How many followers does Jesus have? Me? In the Bible. Uh, Twelve. Twelve. Plus 70, I don't know, plus 120. 3,000. <laughs> How many does he have today? Me. Many, many more? I'm following. Okay. It's followers. So when Christ called his first disciples, he went to these fishermen who were there, and he simply said to them, follow me. That was the words. Follow me. Um, Nyari thinks Professor Noodlebrain's <laughs> hair is growing. <laughs> professor Noodlebrain has a following. They like it when the professor comes and does some nice stuff. So she has a following as well. Um, and thank you very much for making this little uh, uh, demonstration with the, with the straws for us. Um, uh, something that is there for us to learn. And, and, and just because I'm thinking of that, this wor these words, follow me, are words that were spoken not only by Pastor Gabriel at least once today, but I also heard some of the children speaking those words that they want to follow who, who Christ is. I wonder, could we open this door um, and then just put a chair out there or something so there's a nice draft or so coming through. I think it's good for us to have a bit of fresh air. And then baptisms this afternoon in the fresh air too. This afternoon, the ba baptisms in the fresh air. I'm speaking like Gabriel now. Goodness <laughs> me. Um, so I, I just want to do something. Pastor Gabriel did half of it, and I'm going to do the other half. And that is to say, and I'm looking all of you in the eye right now, and I'm going to I'm going to ask the question: Is there anyone who is in this place at this moment? who saw what was going on in this water a moment ago and thinking, I want to be there too. I also want to do that. There must be more. There's one. There's two. There's a few more. In fact, there's a lot more. Oh my goodness. I'm so happy. I'm asking you to put your hands up because when we do put our hands up, then everybody can see that's what we want to do. And so I would like to say, well done, guys. That is good. That is good to have that in the, in the forefront of your mind. You want to do that. And I'm just wondering, I think we need to call some of the kids forward, don't we? They made a poster in primary class this morning in their Sabbath school. They actually talked about baptism in their class. So can those who made those, poster, uh, those posters please come forward? We want you to show it to everybody. Please. Um, not only are you coming to show your little posters, you're also coming to, when you are showing these posters, you're going to come to demonstrate your desire that in the future somewhere you want to be baptized as well. Can I call those kids forward? 
you made a lovely little poster. Would you come and show everybody? And who would like to read what it says? All right. Lovely. Hold, hold. Okay, we've got four hold, of them. Hold the mic for them. Yeah. Okay, so we're going to have you guys read what it says on your poster. Uh, Nathan belongs to God. Excellent, Nathan. Amen. Thank you so much. I belong to the Lord. Jesus and God and the Holy Spirit is my light and my savior. Amen. Excellent. Um, Hadassah belongs to the Lord. Amen. Amen. Jasmine belongs to God. Excellent. Amen. Ziva is a kid of God. Eugene belongs to God. Amen. Yes, well done. No, you got we got Nathan as well already. He he had his hand up. So what so would you like to say? Adam belongs to God. Yes. Amen. All of us. Now, and I believe you're part of this wonderful family. Um, now, let me just check. Who else had hands up to say that they want to be baptized somewhere in, in the near future? Can I ask those of you who did that just to stand up where you are? Just to stand up. Look at this. Look at this. Look at this. You know, when, you know, when we, we, we had such a wonderful occasion after we first used this church for the first time. I don't know how many years ago that was. Not too, too many. And when we said, will we ever use this? And we actually used it in the first year after we built it. And now we're going to be overusing it. Grace, isn't that good? Yes. Thank you, guys. Thank you very much. Please have a seat. Okay, you can. So those of you who just stood up, please speak with Pastor Gabriel or speak with your parents and let them speak to him or somebody make sure that the message gets passed on, that there needs to be some work done in that regard. Yes? And... And I look at this water, and the water is just water. It's not magical or anything like that. But as Pastor Gabriel explained earlier on, it is there to serve a purpose, to serve a symbolic purpose, to, to allow us to also be ba buried like Jesus was buried and then, and then got back up again um, out of the grave. So Jesus goes, he finds these guys, and he says to them, Follow me. Follow me. Simple two words. Um, if I said to you, follow me, you would go in your mind, okay, depends where we're going. If I said, if, if I said follow me, there's cake over there, then possibly you would come and follow me. If I said, follow me, we've got to go and dig a deep hole to do some physical work, then maybe some would not want to follow me. And so Christ comes to them and he says, follow, follow me. And then in a parallel passage in, in Luke chapter 5, um, uh, it uses the phrase, it says, they forsook all as they began this new journey with Jesus. They've, and, and the word forsake literally means that they turned their back on their current lives. They completely said, okay, this is who we are. We're turning away from this and we are going to do something that we have never thought we will do. It implies a total commitment from their, uh, from their side. So, so this wasn't just a part-time project that they thought, oh, let's go and see what this is all about, and then maybe perhaps along the way, if we don't really like it, we could do something else. Um, they left everything, and by doing so, um, uh, they wanted to stick with Jesus for the rest of their lives. And so... By agreeing to follow Jesus, they consented to be his students. I wonder how many of us have been students in some point in our lives. Students. I'm talking about school, kids, after school, if you studied stuff. And for those of us who went after school and did some, some studies after school, um, and you finished your degree or whatever it was, uh, you completed that. Not so? Are you still busy being a student in that particular degree? No. And, and, and you know, I've, 
I've, I've had the, the opportunity to do a few, and then I, I realized after I graduated from there, oh, but I can't remember a thing from everything. But what I do remember is this. I know where to go and find the answers. Um, so, I mean, I, I mean, I can remember some things, hopefully. Uh, you would be very disappointed if I couldn't remember anything, but at least I, I know where to go and find the answers. But we were students, and then when the degree is over, then we stop. But to be a disciple of Christ is not like that. It means you're going to be committed to that course for the rest of your life. Amen. And so what does it mean to follow Jesus? And it is interesting to note that this first directive that Jesus ever said to the disciple Peter was what the words against the wall in the back says, follow me. And we find that in Matthew chapter 4 verse 19. He says there in Matthew chapter 4, verse 19, Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. Remember that. And so, and then the last thing that Jesus said to Peter before the end of his ministry here on earth, in, in the book of John, at the very end of the book of John, in, in, in chapter 21, we see that Jesus says to Peter once again those same words. Follow me. Now, I'm going to just unpack those two for us briefly. Because I know that the, all the excitement is now behind us and all the, the water is empty. You guys have now been baptized. And here is this man standing and talking a lot of 15 pages, two hours of sermon. And, you, and we want to eat. This food is getting ready. So I'm just going to unpack follow me and follow me for us a little bit. If you will allow me. It'll just take us about, like I said, about two hours. Um, but here's the thing. When Jesus speaks, it's important for us to listen, right? Jesus is this kind of person that when he speaks, we need to listen. There is a good reason why we should listen. Um, he's the one to whom all the authority in heaven has been given. Matthew chapter 28. Jesus is the one of whom it is, of it is said, he is forever worthy the lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. Revelation chapter 5. He is the one to which uh, to whom every knee will bow. The one account of whom all the tribes on earth will moan, Revelation 1.7, and from whom the fury of God's wrath will be executed, Revelation chapter 19. It's that kind of supremacy. Jesus is the one who is the creator of the universe, um, who's made us, made everything, and who knows that there's more hair on my head than what there is on Charles's at this moment. <laughs> and so in all of his supremacy, Jesus is also our shepherd. And since he is our shepherd, what do sheep know about their shepherd? They know the voice of their shepherd. And if Jesus is our shepherd, shouldn't we be understanding his voice? And therefore, by virtue of his power and his grace... Because that of the fact that he is sovereign and, um, and that he is our savior. When he tells us certain things, then perhaps we should listen carefully. So when he says, make disciples of everybody, then there's very strong meaning in that. There's, there's a long lasting meaning in that. So Christ used two distinct phrases intentionally and peter certainly understood the profound distinction between them by the way those two phrases follow me and once again at the end follow me and so in the first instance matthew 4:19 it was a forceful you guys follow me i've got something for us to go and do and what do they do they leave their lives behind fishermen who only knew how to go fishing. They didn't know how to make a life in, a, in another way. And the Lord was formally and powerfully directing Peter and the others to become his students. And by leaving their past behind, these four disciples were making a commitment to learn from Jesus. They recognized him as a teacher, as a rabbi, and they were willing to dedicate their lives to be with him. In a sense, Jesus was saying... 
If you want to learn from me, follow me. And then we jump to the story at the end of the Gospels. And in the book of John, chapter 21, there is a beautiful story there that is playing out. About the disciples coming back from the water. They've been out there all night. And, of course, they see something's happening on the beach. And Jesus is busy making breakfast. And then after they had breakfast, a very interesting conversation happens. And, um, and, uh, and so, uh, in, in John chapter 21... From verse 15 it says, When they had finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Son of John, do you love me more than these? Yes, Lord. Now remember, these guys have been together for three, three and a half years. Day and night, they knew each other very, very well. Yes, Lord, he said, you know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my lambs. And again Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He answered, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said, take care of my sheep. The third time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was hurt because Jesus, <coughs> excuse me, Jesus asked him a third time, do you love me? He said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my sheep. And then he continues in verse 18. Very truly I tell you, when you were younger, you dressed yourself and went where you wanted. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will dress you and lead you where you do not want to go. Jesus said this to indicate the kind of death by which Peter would glorify God. Then he said to him, what? Follow me. Now, that motiva motivating, confrontational, and personal conversation between the two of them, do you love me? Do you love me? And for the third time, do you love me? And each time he says to him, feed my sheep, feed my lambs, feed my sheep. This conversation was, was coming to its own conclusion when Peter turns around and he sees the apostle John following them. Maybe they were going for a bit of a walk there on the beach. And, um, and, Pete, and it says in verse 20, And Peter turned and saw that the disciple whom Jesus loved was following them. This was the one who had leaned back against Jesus at the supper and said, Lord, who is going to betray you? Perhaps John was eavesdropping. You know, perhaps John heard the first time when Jesus said, Do you love me? And then he got, hey, 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 hang on, hang on, hang on. I've got competition. Can you see that thing happening? Um, and perhaps he was eavesdropping on their, on their discussion. And perhaps he too wanted some alone time with Jesus. But for whatever reason, Peter used this occasion to redirect the Lord's appointed uh, the, the, and, and, and convicting questions to someone else. And so Peter looked at John and he said to Jesus, but what about him? You know, when, when we are being asked the question, are you going to take care of this? And you know there's other people who can also take care of this. Sometimes we go, uh, sometimes we buy some time and hope that the question will be redirected to someone else. You know, what about him? Can he not, maybe? Um, and so, in verse 22, Jesus responds to Peter and he says, If I want him to remain alive until I return, what is that to you. You, Peter, must follow me. So Jesus sort of draws the line under it with Peter. He says, no matter what the situation is with anybody else, I was saying to you, follow me, and I still stick with the same sentiment. You must follow me. In today's language, we would say Jesus uh, might have said, um, it doesn't matter about anyone else who's in this place. You, now I'm trying to look all over at every eyeball I can see. You must follow me, is the directive that we get from Jesus. We go, yeah, but uh, you know, so and so and so and so, and this is what they did and this is what they didn't do. You must follow Jesus. Amen. This last command sounds like the first. 
but in its tone and in its intent, it's a very different thing. In the first instance, guys, come, I want to teach you stuff. Now, Jesus knows where we are in time, and he knows what is about to happen with him, and he knows what kind of responsibility these guys are going to have once he's leaving. And he goes, you must follow me. Don't worry about anyone else. Stay close to me. And these two bookend commands, follow me, clearly articulate the genius of what happens when we are a, a disciple of Christ. We follow him. There's a command, we have to follow him. But the moment we start following him, and just because he said we must, we go on and we go on. And you know what's going to happen in two or three weeks? You're going to run into, into all sorts of problems. And you're going to think, well, did something go wrong on the day when I got baptized? Why, is, why, why am I being tested like this? And Jesus says, just follow me. You know, just follow me. For whatever is going wrong in your life, we must know that the devil is going to try his best and make life as difficult as he can for you. But follow me. And so we're not only following Jesus because of the directive he gave in the first place for us to follow him, but we're following him because when we do, that is where we can find the solace that we need in the times when times are getting rough with us. And so that is what it means to be a disciple of Jesus. We become a follower or a learner. We become someone who, who takes up the ways of someone else. We, we take up the ways that... That, belongs to, that belong to Jesus. And applied to Jesus, a disciple is someone who learns from him to live like him. Someone who, because of God's awakening grace, confirms he, his or her, uh, her own words and ways to be the words and the ways of Jesus. And to be a disciple, I think, in the most basic sense, is simply to try and emulate who Christ is. And I think the, the idea of discipleship uh, that Jesus left with us uh, is really to become a wholehearted follower of Christ. Okay, I know we're not all fishermen here. Um, and uh, when Jesus says, follow me, we don't have to all leave our jobs behind and now find ourselves somewhere just going door to door or something like the disciples did back in the, in the New Testament times. But Jesus wants for us to have a responsibility of being a disciple even where we are and even in the places where we find ourselves to be every day, where we are able to touch the lives of those who are around us and for them to also get the message that Jesus leaves with us, follow me. Second Peter 3 helps us to see through the knowledge of who God is, through the knowledge of the salvation that he's given to us, through the knowledge of the promises he's given us, and, and then in, by faith in God, by faith in his promises in our minds, we know that we can change and be like that. Now I know I'm preaching to the choir, to most of us who are here. I know some of you personally, and I've been involved with some of your lives personally. And, and, you, and there's some of you who really know me well as well. And you know some of the difficulties I've had in my life. And some of the challenges I've had to, to struggle with in my life. And then I can stand here in front of you, and we can all just be honest with one another and say, Yes, we know. Life is not just straightforward and very simple. There are so many occasions where we can come to the place... And we will say, I don't know where this Jesus is that we are supposed to be following. And that happens. And when that happens, this is what I want to say to you today. Because I've just been able to find myself luckily in this place where I can stand and say, look, if life is like that for you right now, just follow him. Even if you can't see where he is, you know where he's going. Just follow him. As he told the woman at the well... The father is seeking true worshippers. Remember that story um, where he found this woman um, at Jacob's well and, and, and they were getting water and they had a conversation. And, and he was saying to her that the father is seeking true worshippers, not artificial worshippers, true worshippers. Not just people who say, yes, I know there is a God and, and you, know, you hold your thumbs and hope that everything will go well. But people who worship God for for whom God is. 
If we will follow Jesus, we must worship God through Jesus because Jesus is our mediator and Jesus himself because he is God as well. And so John shows another picture of Jesus about how we are meant to emulate what Jesus does. He, he shows us another picture of who Jesus is in the book of John in, in chapter 13. There is a story of the disciples getting together in the upper room and there they are. Uh, having a meal together and as the tradition is somebody one of the servants of the house needs to come around and wash all the feet of of whoever uh, came traveling from a far distance because their feet will be full of dust and so on and and then there would be a servant who would come in and wash the feet of all these dust these dusty people and uh, and since there was no servant that night Jesus himself, when all the disciples were looking across the table at each other, thinking, well, I'm not the lowest of us all. I'm not the, the one who's going to get up and, and serve these other people. Jesus himself got up. And then he started washing the feet of all the disciples around the table. Jesus is a servant. All the Jews ever wanted was a king. A king and and, 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 and even the day when Jesus came into Jerusalem on that day, before, before that very day, uh, they actually threw out palm leaves in front of his donkey and praised him as a king. They wanted a king, but he's a servant. He came to this earth not to be served, but to serve and give his life as a, rams, as a ransom to all, to all of us. And that's what's been demonstrated here today in this water. And as a servant... Jesus says to his disciples, If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I've given you an example, also you should do as I've done for you. And of course, that's just another one of those occasions in the Bible where we can see the demonstration of God as a human on earth, being a servant himself, and asking us to be servants of one another. So a second thing is that when we are disciples, we are also servants of one another. You cannot just be baptized and you come out of the water and you say, yes, I have arrived. Now is when the work actually starts. Now is when we become servants of one another. And there's some practical implications of the fact that we have been baptized. There's two requirements that are essential. I'm, I'm going to finish with this idea. This is the last thing I want to teach you, if I'm allowed to. Um, practical implications of what it means to be a disciple of Jesus. Uh, being, this, being a disciple of Jesus means to learn from him and to stay close to him. Um, and so, first of all, how do we learn from him? Um, we, we learn from him by carefully listening to his teaching. And, of course, Gabriel was telling us about all the times that these, all the, the, the amount of time that he had spent already with these individuals who were baptized today because they were learning about Christ and, and from the Word of God and so on. And so the teaching ministry of Christ was one of the most important aspects of his earthly ministry. Um, it is an interesting thing to note that immediately after calling the disciples, they followed him through Galilee, listening to him, Teaching and preaching. The Bible uses those two words. Teaching and preaching. That's what he did. And they were all listening to him and learning from him. In fact, Christ's most famous sermon that he preached, the Sermon on the Mount, was, pre was presented uh, to those people soon after he instructed Peter, James, and Andrew, and John to follow him. And obviously, the Lord's teaching ministry was one of the most important aspects of how uh, he discipled um, them and how he made them his followers. Now, his final mandate to the twelve also included an emphasis on his teaching. So the last thing he ever gave to them that they should do included that. So in Matthew chapter 28, at the very end of the chapter, the very end of the book of Matthew, he says, Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations and baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all the things that I've commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even until the end of the age. And so teaching and preaching have almost become blasé today in today's world. Um, you know, uh, how many churches are around where 
you would go to that particular church and find that there, every week there's only one unique message in that church. How many churches do we have that, this, that exists today? Um, and, um, and there's only one message happening one day of the week. Um, and if they happen to have two services, it's likely to be the same message repeated. Um, and so it's very, it, 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 teaching has become something that is, uh, is probably um, happening less and less as we, as we carry on. Um, and so, and we need to know that the proclamation of scripture has to become once more a priority if we're going to teach what it means to be a disciple of Christ. Christ emphasized teaching then, and he expects teaching to be a priority for his disciples even today. And so these followers of Jesus were learners, they were pupils, they were students. And learning from Christ today means hearing, listening, studying, and applying what it is that we've learned. The second thing is that um, being willing to do what he said. If we are going to be disciples, it's not only, this is a practical course, it's not only theory. We don't just learn about all the good stuff, but we have to actually live that kind of life as well. And so there is a second important aspect um, of what he taught his disciples. He expected his followers to put what he taught in practical use in their lives. He wanted his disciples to apply those truths that he instructed. And that um, principle too is included in this great commission that I just read. And I'll just repeat it to you. He says, go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things I have commanded you. Now, the word observe in this passage does not mean to see or to look. It rather means to do or to implement. We have to see what Jesus does, and then we have to do what Jesus does. Um, so there are several passages in the New Testament that underscore this idea. Now, how do we stay close to Christ? How do we stay close to Christ? Quick, help me with this. You're helping me to, con to make my sermon shorter when you do. Reading the Bible and praying. There we go. When first heard my sermon is going to get shorter, she jumped in quickly. Reading the Bible and praying. Those are the two ways that we can get closer to Christ. Why? Because he, he, He's in heaven. He's not here with us. We can't see Him physically. The Holy Spirit is here. We can't even see the Holy Spirit physically. And you know, how often, I, how often when I drive in my car and there's nobody sitting next to me, of course I have a conversation with Jesus who is sitting next to me. And that's a very practical and simple way to be practical about prayer. If you haven't done it, or if you see somebody sitting in the car and talking to no one, <laughs> when you're driving, perhaps they're talking to Jesus. Who knows? But maybe some people have thought that who is this crazy guy for doing this? Um, he took a special opportunity to, 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 to end that great commission by saying, I am with you always. I am with you always, even until when? The end, the end of the age. So is Jesus with us? Yes. He is with us. His earthly disciples realized that he was about to leave them to return to his heavenly father. But in this last time together, he helped them to understand that because he was God, he could actually be with us personally, right where we are. So even though he's not physically present, we have to spend time. When we read the Bible, by the way, and if you don't know how to read the Bible, go and start with those four books, the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. They tell the story of the life of Jesus. And once you got through that story, you'll become more familiar with what God wants to tell you. The second one was to pray. You know, when Jesus went missing during the day of activity, it was usually because he went somewhere to pray. And, and he taught the disciples how to pray. He even, he even spelled it out to them and said, this is how you should pray. And then he gave them a prayer that they can pray. And the disciples were a bit slow. You know, they were fishermen. They were not academic. They were struggling sometimes with all the theory. 
Um, and they were struggling sometimes even with the practical application. There were times when Jesus says, please pray for me. I'm going to go in a place where this is very difficult. I need you to stay awake and pray for me. And then he gets there and they couldn't even stay awake and pray because it was just too difficult. And so, so, so don't be hard on yourself if when you want to pray, you fall asleep and realize when you wake up again, oh, that one went out the door. It happens to all of us. Now, why does this matter? It's a question of leadership. It's a question of, remember my followers on my phone, there's quite a few of them, I don't know. <laughs> um, but I, I can't have followers, and if I have followers, then I have to be a leader of some sort, don't I? I mean, there's followers, then there must be leaders. Have you ever been in the bookshop? How, I can't remember when I was in a bookstore last, but I like going to bookstores. But these days you just do everything online, don't you? So when you went to the bookstore, was there a section for followers? You know, you get a section for self-help, and there's a section for children, and a section for everything. But is there a section for followers? No, there's only a section for leadership in the bookstore, but not one for followers. I would suggest that the section that is called Christianity should be the section called followers. That's what I would like to suggest. Because who are the followers? It's the Christians. Um, um, you know, followers is a term that has changed over time. And even in today's world, the word followers, when you hear it, we immediately associate it in some way with what's going on on our phones. And so Instagram and Twitter enable people both uh, to become famous and to make their own brands. And then you go and somebody tells me, Somebody, you know, um, I've got a, a jigsaw puzzle lying on the table at the moment. There's always a jigsaw puzzle lying on the table, half done. And this week somebody saw my jigsaw puzzle and they said to me, you know what you should do if you want to make money? Put your camera up here. What do you call it, uh, Charles, when, it, uh, when, the, when, the full, when the video goes very quickly what, that they see? Time lapse. He says, put your camera here on the, table, on the table and let it do a time lapse of how you do your jigsaw puzzle. I said, how am I going to make money? He says, there's people who do this. They build their jigsaw puzzles and they have it on time lapse. And they have hundreds of thousands of followers just watching how people build their jigsaws. And YouTube pays them because... So it's all about having followers, isn't it? If you have enough followers, you can make a lot of money. And then we look at the scene where Jesus is on the cross. And how many followers were there? It's interesting that the primary word for people who worship Jesus as Lord and Savior is the word follower. Now, in the context of Jesus' day, a disciple was a follower, not just in a general sense, but also in a very particular way. A disciple tended to um, be either a pupil, someone who um, would sit at the feet of the master as an apprentice. And I think there's something to this. Even the first disciples, they graduated to nothing else. You know, you think, when, when I'm done with this course, I'm going to graduate and do something else. They graduated to nothing else. When we are disciples of Christ, and I don't know if we ever graduate. I, I don't think we, we actually do. We always keep being disciples and followers of Christ. And, um, and, and one of the many reasons that we do is because of that one aspect of Jesus' life. The one that says... Be a servant of one another. When we are a disciple, we are a servant of our brothers and our sisters. And so being a disciple is a follower, but not just in a casual way. An apprentice or a pupil has essentially given up a whole variety of opportunities to follow one master. And we can follow a lot of things. We can follow sports teams. We can follow musicians. We can follow uh, politicians um, and so on. Um, but to be a disciple of someone is to turn your life over to that person and the way that they want you to be. And to get the wisdom from them and to live in that way. And so that is discipleship. It is following Jesus and who he is, God, 
and becoming more like him. And as I pull my phone out in order to start my, my social media, <laughs> um, I'm aware that this one area, um, this is one area where all of us have changed a lot in the last number of years. You can give, you can put a phone in the hands of a four-year-old and they will figure out stuff on there that we don't even know how to, to, how to do. Isn't it so? The, the young kids, they just know about these things. When we try to do what young kids can do, you know what happens? It's like, it's like having two straws and we're the one straw sitting on the outside of the glass and we suck and suck and suck and nothing comes out. And by the way, those of you who haven't had the opportunity to try what the children tried this morning with their glasses, go and do it this afternoon. Even if you do it in secret so that nobody else can see, just go and see how funny it is. Because when you put two straws, one is inside the water and the other one is outside, you can suck as much as you want to. Very little water comes through. You have to be very strong to actually win that game. And so, and, and so it's all about the focus. If we are going to be disciples of Christ, we cannot have two straws where one is out there and the other one is here by Christ and say, yes, I am, I am a disciple of Christ. And I'm still also focusing on whatever else it is that just depletes me, takes all my energy because I'm trying so hard and nothing wants to come. Lord, please bless me. But my one straw is out there sucking all the rubbish. But put both straws inside the cup and say, Jesus, I need your blessing in my life. And you know what? What happened when both straws came in? Twice as much as when there was only one straw. Go and play with it. You know, adults, I know you like to try stuff. You see, oh, the kids. Uh, and then you, you know, we did some experiments two years ago during lockdown. And I, there was one experiment in particular where, where I thought this is never, ever, ever going to work. And boom. It's like magic in front of our eyes. And I think, man, I feel so uh, like a child. Uh, it was really good. Um, there's a strong message that is written by one of my favorite authors, Ellen White. And the sentiment is that in Scripture there is a missionary community under a mandate to continue to do the unfinished work for Christ. The baptized, the idea is... Those who, are, those who have been baptized will not therefore withdraw from the world into the church. Rather, will be prepared in the church for the world. And then she says something that um, was very interesting to me that when I, when, I, when I read it, I thought to myself, this is really striking very, very hard. Um, it says, every disciple is born into the kingdom of God as a missionary. And then the word ordained is being used. Everyone who came out of the water of baptism have been ordained to work for the Lord in ministry. And today, so if there was any qualification, then today you, you received your qualification. But actually that qualification doesn't end your discipleship. It actually starts your discipleship. Because you're all called. None of us here are to sit around and say, what about them? What about him? What about her? You know, they've been in this for a long time. You know, what about them, Lord? Jesus says, I'm looking at you, and I say, follow me. Each of us, and especially those who have been baptized, have been ordained to work in the vineyard that Jesus gave us. May the Lord bless you. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Jimmy, for sharing that message. Uh, I may or may not have looked at how many followers I have on my social media. No, I didn't, I didn't do that. I want to call the four individuals that were baptized, Janet, Jessica, Ishvan, Chanel, come up here to the front. I also want to call the pastors and the elders to come forward. We're going to have a special prayer for them. When you read in Scripture, in the book of, the book of Acts, uh, you find an Acts Come on up here to the front. So all our pastors and elders, come on forward. We're going to lay hands. Tamuka, come on over. Come over here. Let's put arms around them. And Jessica and Janet. 
They are. Okay, awesome. You read in the book of Acts, chapter 2, uh, Peter is, is preaching and he says, Repent and be baptized. He says, For the forgiveness of your sins. And then it says, And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And then a few chapters later in Acts chapter 8, you find that Peter and John, they go to meet Philip. And they're a, a huge group of new believers that were just recently baptized. And the Bible says in verse 14, When the apostles who were at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent Peter and John to them. And verse 15 it says, Who when they had come prayed for them that they might receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. As Pastor Jimmy has mentioned, when we are baptized, not only is it for remission of sins, not only is it forgiveness of sins, that's the first thing, being baptized in the cleansing, forgiveness of Christ. But then there's also what happens afterwards. Coming out of the water, yes, you, you know, you're a little cleaner, you know, so to speak. But what happens when you go home this afternoon? What happens on Monday when you go to work? What happens on Thursday when you arrive back home? There is a biblical practice in the book of Acts that when a person was recently baptized, they would lay hands on them, that they would receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The reason why you receive that gift is because the Holy Spirit is the one that's going to help you to learn how to live more like Jesus. That when you read the Word of God, you can hear the, the voice of Jesus speaking to you. When you go out into the community, you can bear good witness to the community and care for your fellow man. Now, Jessica, is she coming here right now? She'll be coming here in a, in a second there. Uh, yes, Pastor, please. She'll be here. She's probably with Maya, right? Yeah, she's probably with Maya. It's okay. No problem. So what we're going to do is Charles, Tamuka, uh, Genevieve is somewhere. I think she's... Okay. There they come. Yeah, come on over, Jessica. And Genevieve will call you up here to the front. Come on up here. Yep. And I'll ask each one of our elders to take, take one of our newly baptized persons, place an arm on them. So yeah, just come up to them. And then we're going to pray for you, and then we have some gifts for you as well. And Judith, if you'll help me with the gifts, come on over here. Oh, Maddie, there you go. We have some gifts. One of them is to learn a little bit more about the fundamental beliefs of the Adventist Church, of who we are here. And then this one, and inside, uh, Judith has printed special, special bookmarks for you guys to keep with you there. And then this is what the Bible says about, it's just 31 Bible studies. You can do it as a daily devotional. I think you already have one, but you have an extra one here now. Things that as you are continuing and growing in your relationship with Christ, these are some things that can help you grow more in the Word of God. So they're topical devotionals, so you cover different topics and just help you in that growth process. And then afterwards, after we pray, Genevieve, we have some bags for you here as well. Now, the prayer is for these individuals who have been newly baptized. We're going to lay hands on them. But I'll ask our congregation here at large. If you say, you know what, I also desire the baptism of the Holy Spirit in my life. Or perhaps you say, I want to be newly baptized in the Spirit. Maybe this week or maybe last year or maybe 10 years ago, you started kind of getting a little bit colder in your walk with Christ. If your desire is to say, I want to be re-baptized with the Spirit once again, Will you join me in standing? And we're going to have a special prayer for you as well. So join me at, at this point. You can stand. We'll pray for them, and we'll pray for our congregation at large. Feel free to join us. Let's lay hands on them, please. Father God, we thank you so much. Because as we look upon your word, we find that our Christ, our Savior, our Messiah, came to deliver us from sin and death and the problems and consequences of this world. Now, Father, today this... These four individuals, Ishvan, Janet, Jessica, and Chanel, have made a decision that while they're in this world, they will live for Christ and Christ alone. Now, Father, we pray that the deliverance of the coming of our Savior Jesus may be soon. We, are not, we don't want to wait another year, another two years. So, Father, we pray that these four individuals, may once, once they walk out of this place, may they live in the proclamation of the return of our Savior Jesus. Father, we see in the book of Acts chapter 8 that Barnabas and Paul, that the disciples laid hands on them to anoint them for the work of preaching the gospel. So Father, here as elders and as pastors, we lay our hands upon Jessica, on Ishvan and Chanel and on Janet. 
And we ask for the gift of the Holy Spirit in their life. Amen. That just as they've been washed from sin, now that the outpouring of your Holy Spirit may be manifest upon them. Amen. That their, thar- their, their thoughts, their hearts, their minds may be wholly surrendered and consecrated to you, Lord. Amen. But just as these four individuals have been prayed for now, we pray for our congregation at large and those that are standing. We have a desire to be rebaptized with your Spirit again today. We ask, dear Lord, that this church may be known as a people not only that love Jesus, not only that are expecting for Him to return, but this may be a church that cares for their fellow man here in this community. We know that we're in a world filled with pain and tragedies. There's something new happening in the world that causes pain and hurt. Lord, we want to be the hands and feet of Jesus. So we ask that your anointing may come over these four, over those that are standing and those of us that are here, that this church may be heralds of the love and the soon coming of our Savior Jesus. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 So hand it over to them. If you bring the bags for them, I think they're back here. Stay standing up here. We're going to eat in a few seconds. We have our ladies, by the way. Make sure we thank our ladies who have been serving in the back, who have been preparing the food for the past few minutes, well, last hour or so, getting things ready for all of us to eat. Stay behind and eat. We're going to put our tables out. And then if you want to come and greet them and give them a hug, feel free to do so. But here's the beauty of today, the last 30 seconds here. This is, these aren't the only baptisms we have today. We have four young adults who are getting baptized this afternoon. In Edinburgh, sorry, Pastor, in the Pentlands. You can see up there we have some other names that are being baptized. Millie, Eleanor, Tolu, and Sean. And then if you go to the next slide, Charles, you'll see that we have... Uh, the uh, location. Now, if you want to know the exact pin of where to park, let me know, and I'll give you the exact pin of where to park. It's about a 15-20 minute walk from the parking lot to the reservoir where the baptisms are going to be. The baptisms are going to be at 4.30 this afternoon, so we'll eat, and I want to invite you guys. It's a little bit of a drive. It's not too far, but it's a good reason to drive. So we want to go and celebrate the four baptisms for our four young adults who are being baptized today as well. So at this time, we'll say uh, God bless you guys. Have a wonderful Saturday. If you want to stay and eat, feel free to stay and eat. If you want to come give them hugs, come on over and give them hugs. God bless you guys. Thank you very much. Amen.
Um, what do you know? What do you know? What's wrong? Awesome. You know goodness of God. Oh, Holy Spirit. You know that one. Oh! Chanel.
Bye. 